Hello, everyone. My name is Bruce, and I'd like to welcome you to today's episode of the Kick Bash Kitchen. In today's episode, we're actually going to fulfill a community request, which was to prepare a rather large Hubbard squash into a fall favorite side dish. But that alone wouldn't justify an episode. So we're going to take things a bit further, as we always do here at the Kick Bash Kitchen, and we're going to break this episode down into three parts. Part one, we're simply going to prepare some Hubbard squash. Part two, we're going to take some of that Hubbard squash and we're going to create a European style noodle out of it called a Schupf noodle. And in part three, we're going to utilize that squash flavored Schupf noodle into a incorporated into a casserole that I think you'll like very much. So without further ado, let's get started in preparing some Hubbard squash. So I found that the biggest reason why people hesitate to prepare a Hubbard squash is their sheer size. Sure, you can get one from your grocery store that's about the size of a football, but it won't be as tasty as one you can get from the farmer's market. However, you do get one from the farmer's market, you get something this big or bigger. So at this point, we'll say, well, okay, how are we going to break this down into manageable portions that we can, you know, bake in the oven? Well, your first thought might be to use a hatchet. Well, I found if you use a hatchet, it has a tendency to just poke hatchet-sized holes in the squash, and it doesn't really help you break it apart. The next thing you could do is you could use a knife, but the rind of a uh, Hubbard squash is very tough and very thick, so you have to apply a lot of pressure on the knife, and you run a pretty good risk of cutting yourself. Not that like I've ever done that or anything. So you're probably asking yourself, self, okay, fine. Well, how, how are we going to break this open? Well, we're going to take inspiration from our channel title and we're going to bash it. We're going to bash it if it's a Halloween pumpkin that we were displeased with. Or crack it like an egg, like a, I don't know, a Giga Notoriosaurus egg. And Normally I would do something like this on my front porch, which is made of cement, but for the purposes of getting this on video, we're going to do it right here on this brand new expensive countertop. So if it breaks, I expect a whole lot more subscribers to help me pay for it. And if it doesn't, well, then we will proceed. Uh, oh, and one last note, if, uh, if you're at all squeamish, please turn away. So, here we go. And there you have it. So I've taken the two large halves out to my front porch, bounced them on the cement a couple more times to break them into smaller pieces, which are relatively flat and lend themselves to being placed on a cookie tray and baked in the oven. Next, we want to take our individual pieces and we want to scrape off the stringy stuff as well as the seeds. But we only want to scrape off the bare minimum. And the reason for that is the sweetest part of the squash is right up against the stringy stuff. So we only want to take off as little as possible. Next, we're going to apply a little light oil to our pieces, which you can see I've arranged on cookie trays that are lined with foil for baking in the oven. Now the idea here is to use a light oil rather than a heavy one because we don't want to flavor the squash. We only want to get it wet so that it doesn't dry out during the baking process. As we finish up oiling our pieces, we will then place them into our preheated oven at 350 degrees and bake them between an hour and an hour and a half until they are soft enough to mash as if they were mashed potatoes. Okay, our squash has had 1.5 hours in the oven 
and it is now soft enough to pass the fork stabbing test that you would normally use if you were checking a baked potato or a boiled potato to see if it's done. We've also allowed it to cool down enough so that we can handle the pieces. Uh, and they're at a reasonable temperature. So now we're going to start cutting the squash from the rind and we're going to cut down to the green, but we're not going to cut into the green so that we can use just the sweetest part of the squash. So now it's on to the next step where we will mash it up and season it. Okay, at this point we will add some butter to our squash, which will make it a little smoother and creamier. And then we will add some salt and pepper as well to taste. Uh, some people like to add brown sugar to their squash. If you get a fresh, good squash from the farmer's market, it usually doesn't need it. However, if you do want to make it a little smoother, try adding some sour cream to the mixture. And that will do it. Our transformation of a Monster Hubbard squash into a favorite fall side dish is now complete. So that does it for part one of today's episode. If you've liked what you've seen here today, please subscribe to my channel. And if you'd like to learn how to take Hubbard squash and transform it into a European style noodle called Schupfnudeln, stay tuned. Part two is up next. Okay, so Schupfnudeln, what are they anyway? Well, it's essentially a potato noodle that's um, in many European dishes in countries such as Germany, Austria, Switzerland, just to name a few. It's finger shaped. It's a little bit like nochi, but it's not as chewy. As a matter of fact, it's light and poofy, kind of like a steak fry is light and poofy, crunchy on the outside, uh, soft on the inside. And that's exactly what we're going to target for our casserole. Our version made from squash is gonna add the squash flavor to the noodle and we'll be able to pair that with other flavors in anything that we make. One recipe we'll explore in part three of our episode. So without further ado, let's get started making some shook noodle in out of our squash. Okay, let's go over the ingredients for making some Schumpfnudeln. First, we're going to start with two cups of our prepared squash, to which we will add one and a half cups of flour and then two eggs. Now, the amount of flour we may need to adjust depending on how much liquid is in our squash, especially if we froze it and then defrosted it. We also don't want to go overboard with our flour to ensure that we don't wind up with an extra doughy noodle. And then we're going to season it with a little salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Lastly, we have some oil here for which we're going to use to coat our noodles to keep them from sticking to each other. It should take somewhere between a quarter and a half a cup, depending on how many noodles we make. Okay, it's time to assemble our ingredients, starting with our cup and a half of flour, to which we will add our two cups of prepared squash, our two eggs, and then we'll add some salt, some pepper, and then finally some nutmeg. At this point, we put our bowl into our mixer and start mixing until it turns into a really sticky dough. So this is about the target stickiness level you're shooting for. Next, we generously coat our work surface with flour. This is so that we can work with our dough without it sticking to our fingers. Once we have a workable amount of dough dropped into the middle of our flour, we simply roll it around to coat it completely 
and then we roll it out into the shape of a log, which we will then cut into individual noodles. At this point, we grab our handy dandy pastry cutter and we cut our logs into approximately pieces of about one inch in length. And we roll these out into the shape of a finger and we put them on our tray and we rinse and repeat this process until we've made it through our entire batch of noodles. So as you can see, our two cups of squash turned into about three trays worth of schupf noodle which are now ready to be cooked in our boiling water over on the stove. Now it's time for us to actually cook our schupf noodle in, which we'll drop into our boiling water one at a time and we'll cook them in three batches, one for each tray. As the noodles are dropped in, they will initially sink to the bottom, but as they finish cooking, they will begin to float to the surface. So now that our schupf noodlen are floating in the boiling water, they are now completely cooked, so we can fish them out and put them into this colander over here to get rid of the excess water. With all our noodles removed, we're ready to cook the next batch. But before we do, we need to give our noodles that coating of oil that I mentioned earlier, otherwise they will stick together. So that's what we're gonna do next. So in this aluminum container here, I have put about a quarter cup of oil and we'll just give them a stir and move on to our next batch. Our aluminum container with oil now has all three batches worth of noodles. At this point, we can proceed to use some of them directly in a recipe. We can put some of them in a container in the fridge, or we can put some in a container and put them in the freezer for use in a recipe at a later date. So that does it for part two of our episode. If you've liked our exploration of squash schupf noodlen, please subscribe to my channel. And if you'd like to see how we can incorporate these unique tasting noodles into a casserole by pairing it with some other flavors, such as blue cheese, stay tuned, part three is up next. Okay, now it's time to take advantage of the unique flavor of schupf noodlen we have just made and incorporate it into a recipe. The recipe I've chosen is a pan casserole where we're going to combine and pair the squash flavor with some blue cheese, some bacon, some herbs, and some spinach. So without further ado, let's go over the entire list of ingredients and start putting this together. So I've set out the ingredients here for a single portion of the casserole we're going to make. So we're going to start with approximately 12 to 16 of our prepared schupf noodlen. Then we're going to use about three strips of this thick bacon. Next, we'll use approximately a quarter cup of pine nuts, two cloves of garlic that I've chopped up here and diced them, half an onion for which I have also diced, about two tablespoons of an herbal cream cheese, and two tablespoons of blue cheese, which will pair very well with our squash schuf noodlen, approximately half of a five ounce package of baby spinach, approximately a quarter cup of milk and white pepper to taste. Next, I wanna quickly demonstrate the target size of our bacon strips. So I've stacked the three slices on top of each other. We're gonna cut it once down the center, and then we're gonna cut it crosswise to create little itty bitty strips, and it's ready for the frying pan. Okay, we will now add uh, cut bacon to the frying pan and cook it down until it's really crispy. Okay, now that the bacon is nice and crispy, we're going to fish it out of the frying pan and set it aside. Okay. 
You'll also note that I have more oil in the pan than I will need to fry the remaining ingredients. So we're going to take some of it out and set it aside and keep it just in case we need to add some of it back in later. Okay, next we're going to fry our Schupfnudeln over medium heat in our reduced amount of bacon grease until they have a nice golden brown color to them and have the texture consistency of a steak fry. As our Schupfnudeln finish up cooking, we transfer them to a plate. As you can see, some of them take longer to cook than others, depending on how thick we made them. So we'll just remove them as they individually finish up cooking. With our Schupfnudeln now fried, it's time to move on to some of our other ingredients. Our onions, our garlic, and our pine nuts. At this point, if you needed to add more oil, we could draw from that reserved bacon fat, but we didn't need to in this case. Now that our onions are translucent and our pine nuts are toasted, it's time to add in the remainder of our ingredients, starting with our two tablespoons of cream cheese, our two tablespoons of blue cheese, our quarter cup of milk, our Schupfnudeln, and finally our bacon. We then cook this over medium heat until the cheese is melted and all the ingredients have been combined. Now that our cheeses have completely melted and combined with the milk, it's time to add our half a package of baby spinach to the mix and we'll cook this down at medium heat until the spinach has given up its moisture and wilted. Okay, now that our spinach has wilted, we're almost there. It's time to turn off the heat and serve it up. Lastly, we will season our dish with our white pepper to taste, and then we'll give it a stir, and then it's ready to serve. Okay, that will do it for today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed your culinary journey with me today. If so, please subscribe to my channel. And until next time, keep kit bashing in your kitchen.